author Thomas Hager. Publishers Weekly calls Electric City, the book we'll be discussing tonight, an illuminating portrait of a little known chapter in American history. Mr. Hager is an award-winning author of numerous books on the history of science and medicine, including The Alchemy of Air, A Jewish Genius, A Doomed Tycoon, and The Scientific Discovery That Fed the World But Fueled the Rise of Hitler, and 10 Drugs, How Plants, Powders, and Pills Have Shaped the History of Medicine. He is a courtesy associate professor of journalism and communication at the University of Oregon. So please give a warm virtual welcome to Thomas Hager. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good to be here and um, to uh, chat about Electric City, um, which is a, uh, as, as Kathy noted, I write mostly about the history of science and um, medicine. And this book is really uh, less about science per se, although there's a fair um, development, development of the electricity industry in the book. It's more about people. And um, hang on, I just wanna make sure that we are uh, on and working here. You're good. Are we good? Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry, I got an error message on my side. Um, so it's more about people and uh, about some really, uh, what I thought were fascinating people in American history and how they tried to change the history of the United States. Um, the uh, two main characters in the book are Henry Ford, the auto industrialist, the man who built Ford Motor Company and made Ford the number one selling car in the world in the 1920s. Uh, and his buddy and, and uh, late life friend, Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison, of course, we all know him as the inventor of the electric incandescent light, the light bulb that we used. Uh, well, we don't use electric bulbs like he invented, but uh, that much anymore, but he had a tremendous effect on the development of technology in America. It wasn't just the light bulb. Edison also did the uh, phonograph, the early uh, versions of the uh, movie camera, movie projector, and um, really changed American life in a dozen ways that are fundamental to who we are as people. He did that through his inventions. He was known as the Wizard of Menlo Park, uh, Menlo Park in New Jersey was where he had his laboratory, where he made his inventions. And um, by the time uh, that of the setting of this book, this book is set in the uh, years just after World War I and in the early 1920s. So the years, say five years on either side of 1920 uh, form the uh, heart of this book. During that time, Edison was already a revered elder statesman in America. He was the, uh, one of the best loved Americans that lived during that time. Everybody knew the name of Thomas Edison. Everybody knew what Edison had done for the United States. And so it was uh, quite a, uh, an event when Edison teamed up with Henry Ford um, and uh, tried to create this project, this enormous project that is the subject of my book. So uh, it, happened, it happened like this. Uh, Edison and Ford knew each other, and um, Ford was a, a, a younger man. Uh, one of the first jobs Ford got when he was a young man was not in automobiles, but in uh, electricity. He worked on electrical dynamos as a young man. And one of the first jobs that Henry Ford got was working at, at Thomas Edison's electric company in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, Ford had grown up in Michigan. He was a farm boy. He was a poor farm boy and he hated farm work. He hated the drudgery of farm work and he hated working in outside in all weathers, you know, the kind of stuff that farmers have to do um, to make a, a living in this world were things that Thomas, uh, that uh, Henry Ford really didn't like. Henry Ford was a smart kid and he had a natural aptitude 
for machinery. And he loved tinkering with machines, early machines. You know, this is, uh, he, he grew up, uh, sort of came of age in the 1880s and 1890s. And during that period, um, the steam engines were, were all the things. Steam engines were huge clanking affairs that were used to uh, power factories. And out on the farm, they had steam engines on wheels that they could roll from farm to farm and fire up to help with the harvest. So you could have an engine uh, brought to your farm. These things were huge. They were like locomotives. They were, um, they were called uh, road locomotives, as a matter of fact, because they didn't need tracks to run. They, they were, had big iron wheels. And, uh, but they, the, the engines themselves were the size of railroad locomotives or a little smaller. They would roll from farm to farm and settle down in a field. And then they'd use the steam engine to power uh, a series of, of belts and pulleys to uh, do the various farm chores that needed to be done for the harvest. Well, these machines, these, these road locomotives were Henry Ford's dream machine. He was obsessed with, locomo with road locomotives. He learned everything he could about how they worked, and he was a genius at seeing how engines fit together. So he uh, learned on the farm about machinery, and he stuck with machinery and left the farm work behind. He couldn't wait to get out of his parents' farm and into a machine shop in Detroit, and he ended up working for Thomas Edison. You know, Thomas Edison was at the height of his powers in the 1880s, 1890s. And Ford came in as a, as a young nobody, started working with Edison. And at a, uh, he was, Ford was talented, of course, and Ford came to the notice of his superiors. And uh, his superiors brought Henry Ford to a, um, an Edison company event, a kind of a luncheon one day, um, at which Thomas Edison was uh, present. And the two men met. So uh, Edison is established and older, rich and famous, and Ford is nobody. And um, the two of them start a conversation at this lunch. <laughs> the, young, the young whiz kid who's, who's a, a really adept with machines and the older guy who really understands inventions, they start talking and what they're talking about is an idea that Henry Ford has for um, building a new kind of automobile engine. Ford has been playing around with the idea of uh, powering an automobile with gasoline. And he's inventing a, an improved gasoline engine in his kitchen, in his garage. He's putting together bits and pieces of stuff in his spare time and trying to make this revolutionary new gas engine. And Edison is fascinated. Edison listens to this young man and just thinks, boy, he's really got something going on. And the two of them become friends. But the, uh, uh, it was years later, it was years later after Ford built his engine and put his engine into an automobile that was the most reliable and least expensive automobile the world had ever seen. Um, it's a car he called the Model T. He invented the Model T and then he invented a way to make Model Ts that made them fabulously cheap. Uh, it was called the Assembly Line Factory. Assembly Line Factory was a more important, I think, a more important invention than the Model T itself. The way of making the Model T cut down costs uh, tremendously. And Ford put his factory together with his automobile, flooded the world with Model Ts. Everybody wanted one. This was a, this was a revolution in America uh, because up until the time of Henry Ford, automobiles had been tremendously expensive. They were rich people's playthings. They were luxuries, toys. And um, what Henry Ford did was he created an automobile that was tough enough to work on a farm, you could take it out on dirt roads. You could easy to, it was easy to fix. Everything was very durable, very reliable, and it was dirt cheap. And so could afford a Model T car. 
And suddenly everybody wanted one. Between 1910 and 1920, during that uh, decade, the Model T became the first best-selling, just a phenomenal best-selling car worldwide. Um, it was a tremendous moneymaker for Ford. He owned his own company and all the money went to Ford. Ford, by the time 1920 came around, was a industrialist on a scale unlike anyone else in the world. He was the richest man in the world and one of the most powerful. So that is the setting for the story. The older Edison, the younger Ford, both of them interested in inventions and technology, both of them interested in new ways of powering industry. And the book tells the story of how they tried to create a utopian city in the middle of America that would incorporate all their best ideas and turn those ideas into a new way of living for Americans. Um, so I want to take just a moment and talk about what it was they wanted to change, not just about American technology, but about American society. Um, my book is about an experiment that two great men, very powerful men, tried to undertake on a massive scale in Northern Alabama on, on the uh, river in, uh, Tennessee River in Northern Alabama. And the Tennessee River is a big part of American history. Um, it's, it's sort of uh, all associated with Daniel Boone and the movement of Americans uh, west of the Allegheny and Appalachian Mountains. And it's uh, a, a, a huge source of stories about the birth of America happened in the Tennessee Valley. Well, by the time that Ford and Edison were interested in the area in the 1920s, um, the Tennessee River area in Northern Alabama was one of the poorest uh, parts of the United States. It was tremendously, uh, I guess, the, you know, you could use the word backward. It was, it was, it was almost as if that air part of the United States had gotten lost in the 1700s in many ways. Um, and had not advanced into the 20th century. Part of the problem was the Civil War, which ravaged the area, and um, it never really rebuilt uh, fully. So it got set back by the Civil War. Part of the reason was that the people there tended to be small farmers who worked very tough farms. Many, much of the farming happened up in the hills. Uh, this is a hilly area um, in, uh, sort of Western Tennessee, well, the, the Southern part of Tennessee and the Northern part of Alabama, a lot of hills, a lot of hill people. Um, what uh, uh, people make fun of now is hillbillies live there. And it was uh, a tough way to make a living, uh, farming a small farm up in the hills where the soil wasn't very good and the roads weren't very good and there was no electricity and there was no health care. People lived uh, in cabins that had uh, big holes in the roof. You read descriptions of the way people lived in those days in that part of the country. And it really is like looking back a couple of hundred years. They washed their clothes in big metal uh, washing pots um, that they lit a fire under to heat the water. And they um, uh, had... Uh, very, very um, poor communication with the rest of the world. So when Henry Ford and Thomas Edison decided to go down there and change everybody's life, it wasn't just going into a typical 1920s town. It was like going back to 1780 or 1800 and announcing to the people in an area, uh, the Tennessee River drainage area is about the size of England, um, you announced to people in an area that you are going to pull them out of the 1780s and into the 1920s in one fell swoop. And you're going to do it by building the world's biggest dam across the Tennessee River and using all of the electricity produced by that dam to power industries without using coal. You would use electrical energy. It would be entirely clean 
very, the sort of renewable energy is what we would call it now. Um, but you would invent industries that worked with electricity instead of burning coal. Uh, that was an important step forward because Edison and Ford built their vision around the idea of clean, renewable energy. They both really disliked coal. They thought coal was dirty and polluting and dangerous. Uh, uh, it was unhealthful. They wanted to get away from coal. So they were going to build an entire city built around electricity. This was, of course, Edison's forte. The world's biggest dam, the world's largest power plant producing the world's largest source of electricity would power industries up and down the Tennessee River. What they planned was a new kind of city. They wanted to reshape society around the idea of a new kind of working place. And very quickly, what Henry Ford had in mind when he was thinking about this experiment in Northern Alabama was he was thinking about what a mistake he'd made in Detroit and that the Ford factories, huge factories for making Model Ts, were in and around Detroit, and the city of Dearborn, which is a suburb of Detroit, and in Detroit proper. He had built two huge factories. He was in the process of building the world's biggest factory um, at the time that he was thinking about this experiment in Alabama. Uh, he built these factories in these cities he completely changed the nature of Detroit. His factories employed so many people in such a small area that they created slums. His workers were well-paid and he really cared about his workers. He was very concerned about his workers' wages and their living conditions, but he couldn't help the fact that when you build a huge factory and you concentrate people in a small area, they tend to live in rentals, in city centers, in tenements. They build, the, the result is slum living um, to a great extent. And uh, along with that goes an increase in crime and vice. And uh, these were things that Henry Ford hated. He had this idea in mind that America should be much like the small town, Midwest America farm town that he grew up in. You know, it's a, 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 a few brick buildings downtown, a white church on a village green, a grist mill by the pond. This was the idealized America that he wanted for his workers. He thought this was the best way for people to live. He wanted to create that in Northern Alabama on a vast scale. So he wanted to have an enormous industrial center, a city 75 miles long, employing a million workers. He wanted all of that, but he wanted it without any coal pollution, without any vice or crime. He wanted his workers to live on small farms, farming a few acres in their spare time so that they could bring in their own crops and then working in, in electrically powered industry the rest of the time so that they could have the best of both city life and country life at the same time. They would all drive to, they, instead of a single huge factory like he'd been building in Detroit, he wanted a string of small factories, electrical powered factories um, up and down the river stretching for 75 miles. And around each of those factories would be these smallholder land leases or sales to workers so that they could have five or 10 acres to farm or 20 if they wanted to, and they could afford to do it because he would offer financing for buying the land. And he would offer advice on how to farm it. And he would rent them farm machinery to farm it. When they were done with their crops, which would only take a few weeks, Ford figured, um, they could go to their steady jobs and make a regular wage and improve their land, educate their kids and so on. So he built this vision around a new kind of American life. That was what he and uh, Thomas Edison tried to create in Northern Alabama. Uh, this book tells the story of how they tried to do that and it tells the story of why they failed. And finally, the book tells what happened next. Uh, the story moves eventually toward the creation of one of the greatest achievements of government in the United States, 
a project called the Tennessee Valley Authority, the TVA, which many of you have heard of. Um, this book explains how the TVA started and it started out of Ford and Edison's vision. Eventually, Ford, despite his popularity, despite Edison's name, despite his money, eventually Ford's plans ran head on into the US government, which also had a claim on the uh, power generation and so on in the Tennessee Valley. And for five years, Ford and the US government fought each other over who would control this area. This essentially sort of a private kingdom in Northern Alabama. Who would come out? Uh, would Ford get his wish and build his city? Or would the US government um, stop him and do something else? Eventually, the government found a way to stop Henry Ford and they moved in and they built their own version this new industry, this new way of living. And they called it the TVA. The book tells the story of how the TVA grew out of Ford's ideas as well. There was one last side note um, before we get into Q&A on the book. Uh, the side note is this, uh, along with everything else that was going on in the early 1920s, as Ford was trying to make a national case for the government to give him what he wanted, um, so that he could build his city. He wanted control over a vast area. He wanted all of the electricity out of the world's biggest dam, and he wanted the government to pay for most of it. That didn't happen. What did happen was that Henry Ford decided that the easiest way for him to get what he wanted might be if he ran for president. So the book tells the story of how close Henry Ford came to being president of the United States. And this is a little known story as well, but he made, he was a serious candidate um, for several years in the mid 1920s. And he, a number of observers, and I got to admit, I'm one of them, think that he had as good a shot of, uh, as anyone had at the time of being the president of the United States. Um, he would have run on a platform that incorporated the ideas of this electric city that he wanted to build, his vision for America. That was what he wanted to run on. And uh, for various reasons, it didn't happen. I tell a story in the book, um, but uh, we came very close to having a president in the 1920s who would have been someone who didn't have a day of government service behind him, who came out of private industry um, who was accustomed to running a one-man boss shop. He was accustomed to being the boss of everything at Ford Motor Company, and he would have run the government the same way. Um, and yet he was, he was phenomenally popular with people across the middle of America, farmers, um, workers in fa factory workers, people who looked upon him as a genius, and who would have loved the idea of him running the United States. Um, that almost happened. And uh, the reason it didn't happen was also tied up with the story of this utopian experiment. So that was the book that I got into. Um, that was the, uh, the book that resulted in uh, the long story, longer and richer story of, of Electric City. And uh, I hope everyone gets a chance to read it. I'm open for questions if anybody has any. Okay, well, let's get started with some questions then. Um, first question we have is, how did you get interested in this piece of American history? How did I get interested? Yes. Um, well, uh, it, it was sort of an accident. Uh, you had uh, mentioned um, a previous book that I wrote called The Alchemy of Air. Uh, one of my earlier books was about the development of uh, the, <laughs> well, this sounds very exciting when I say it like this, but it's the development of the fertilizer industry in the United States and, and worldwide. And it turns out to be much more interesting than, than that would sound um, <laughs> for various reasons. But I spent a few years learning about um, the fertilizer industry. And as a result, the book came out, the book was kind of a hit, especially with farmers. It was a surprise hit. And, uh, 
So I got invited to talk at a lot of places around the United States. One of the places I went to was in Northern Alabama. I'd never been to Northern Alabama in my life. And I had this idea, you know, if any of the viewers tonight have read James Agee's work, uh, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. There was a book in the 1930s uh, that detailed life in Appalachia, in this very poor part of the United States. And that was what I thought Northern Alabama was like. I, you know, my mindset was, this is a really uh, poor area still. Um, and then I got to Northern Alabama. I landed at a, a modern international airport in the town of Huntington, um, uh, sorry, Huntsville, uh, Northern Alabama. Um, I was taken to uh, a city, a small city called Florence, Alabama on the banks of the Tennessee River. And Florence was a delightful place. The people were wonderful. There was a, a four-star international hotel up on the hill and I was blown away. So this was a part of the country that came as a complete surprise to me. And I got sort of interested in uh, the fact that it was actually very prosperous. It was very up to date. There are more per square mile in northern Alabama than any other part of the United States, at least at that time. Um, it's, it's the site of space, space research and um, uh, international uh, agricultural research, and there's all this stuff going on. So anyway, I was fascinated. I gave my talk, and on the way out of town, um, I'm, I'm like getting ready to go back to the airport to fly back home to Oregon. And the, uh, the local fellow who was my driver uh, picked me up in the car and we're heading to the airport and we have a little extra time. He knew I was interested in fertilizer history. So he took me out for a little side trip. We had time to take you know a little detour off of our route. Went down the road to this hulking remains of an old fertilizer factory. That's what he wanted to show me. It's this, you know, Ozymandian um, ruin out in the middle of a field of what had to have been a gigantic factory. Um, that was interesting to me. It's like, well, what's the story behind this? How did this end up in the field in Northern Alabama? What was more interesting though is what happened next. The driver, uh, because we had a couple of extra minutes, saw how interested I was. And then he drove me uh, a little ways away to another field in northern Alabama and uh, a sort of a field of yellowing grass. And I couldn't figure out what he was getting at. We drove out into this field and then we saw that the field was actually a network of streets that had been laid out. Uh, like city streets with curbs and fire hydrants, old time fire hydrants and street signs for streets that were never built or were never finished. This was the remains of a city called Ford City. It was a city that had been platted, had started construction and had never been completed. So here I am in a you know, it's almost like being in Egypt, looking at ruins of things in the desert. There's these surprising remains of a civilization that never occurred. It was the combination of Ford City and the gigantic remains of this uh, huge factory that made me wonder, well, what happened here? What was the story? And so I naturally, I went to Henry Ford I started learning about Ford and that led to the rest of the book. Um, it's just picking up a little, you know, as writers do, you sometimes pick up a little thread and then you follow the thread and you find the whole fabric at the end. That's a really interesting story. Who'd have thunk it, right? <laughs> no, I, I was surprised. <laughs> All right, here's another question. Um, what similarities, if any, do you see between the young Henry Ford and today's Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, uh, we think that uh, today's uh, titans of technology are a new thing, but they're really not. They, um, Ford and Edison, too, in, you know, a, a decade or two earlier, Ford and Edison were the uh, titans of technology of their time. 
I think the parallels are obvious. You know, all of these men have built, well, Zuckerberg, I'll leave aside. I'll, Elon Musk is a legitimate uh, innovator, technological innovator. Zuckerberg, um, I know less about, and I'm so, I, but let's say Elon Musk. Elon Musk has, you know, as restless imagination, and he's into electric cars, and he's into space travel, and he's into Hyperloop technology and, and all kinds of stuff. He reminds me very much of Henry Ford and Thomas Edison. These people uh, found success in one technological field, made lives, changed lives for a lot of Americans. And um, then their restless minds couldn't stay with what, you know, with the success they'd had. And they moved on and did more. Uh, they tried to conquer new areas. And Elon Musk is always testing the boundaries of what he can do, I think. And, and uh, we haven't seen the, the last of his innovations, I'll bet. Um, Henry Ford, after his success with the Model T and the, and the assembly line plant, um, really wanted to stretch himself out into this role of society. And I think that that is a factor too that happens to people who become highly successful in, in business and industry is that they begin to think that their ideas, because they worked for them in one area of industry, their ideas and their thinking would probably be better for everybody. And so they try and apply their, you know, they take their successes in one area and apply it to larger and larger <laughs> groups. I think that is a thing that happens sometimes. Um, and that was certainly true of Henry Ford. Henry Ford wanted to take what he saw as common sense ideas about what was good for people. And he wanted to apply that to essentially his own private uh, kingdom. And, and uh, it, it didn't happen, but it would have been interesting to see if it had happened, it would have been interesting experiment uh, because uh, had he gotten what he wanted, we would have an enormous uh, part of the United States that was really under the control of one industrialist um, for his own ends. It would have been similar to having a 75 mile long factory um, that you know, employed a million people and completely dominated uh, an area of, the, of central United States, sort of in the heartland of the United States. Yeah, that domination is something that didn't happen. The government didn't allow it to happen in the 1920s. It would have been interesting to see what would have happened if it did. So I see, I see definite parallels. Not that Elon Musk going to Mars is the same thing, but hey, who knows? <laughs> Yeah, you don't. Um, so you said you, you mentioned about, you know, Ford becoming president. Um, do you think he would have been a good president? And do you think he would have um, he would have made this his whole plan happen had he been able had he been elected? Yes. Had he been elected, he would have made it happen. I have no doubt. Um, the only thing standing in his way, uh, the only reason it didn't happen even without being president, was uh, that a small group of concerned senators in the, in the uh, Senate of the U.S. Congress, small group of senators got together to stop him. Um, Henry Ford was a very, very smart guy. And he did a very good job of currying favor with presidents. He was a camping buddy of the presidents at that time were Warren G. Harding and uh, Calvin Coolidge. Warren Harding was a pro-business Republican president. He and Henry Ford went camping together. They, were, they talked the same language. They were buddies. And as long as, as Warren Harding was president, everything was going Ford's way. It looked great. Um, and then uh, Warren Harding died suddenly when he was in office. Uh, he... Um, passed away of what was probably a stroke or heart disease. Uh, and Calvin Coolidge, his vice president, became president at that time. Calvin Coolidge was much cooler on Ford. And that created a problem. Calvin Coolidge talked a good line, but he didn't actually follow through and give Ford his support. Instead, a group of senators in the U.S. Senate uh, formed an opposition group, and they 
were the people who wanted government control instead of private control for this enormous resource. This, uh, what turned out to be a series of uh, more than a dozen dams on the Tennessee River. Eventually, Ford's image of a single giant dam turned into more than a dozen dams, an enormous project. These senators wanted that to be owned by the people of the United States. They didn't want it to be owned by Henry Ford um, or leased to Henry Ford. So they, they uh, formed an opposition group. It was headed by a fabulous guy, one of my favorite people named George Norris. Everybody should know the name of George Norris because he was a, uh, an old senator from a nowhere state. He was from Nebraska. Apologies to any people in Nebraska. And, uh, but he was uh, my hero. He's a, he's a heroic figure. He is a maverick, never allowed anybody to tell him what to think, called um, uh, lies and falsehoods where he saw them. Didn't matter which party, political party you were in. Didn't matter how powerful you were. If George Norris thought you were lying, he would tell you. And he led the opposition to Ford. And it was actually George Norris who stopped Henry Ford. Eventually, that story is told in the book. Um, however, if he hadn't have been there, that one man, if George Norris, and his and his friends, if uh, George Norris hadn't been there, there's a very good chance that Ford would have gotten what he wanted, even without being president. As the presidential uh, elections heated up um, after Harding's death, uh, and Ford considered running. Part of his calculus was that if he got into the White House, he could make his dream happen on the Tennessee River. He could make his utopian city uh, happen. He could build it because um, he could circumvent the, the Congress to the extent that he needed to, to get the votes that he needed to. He came very close anyway. And if he was president, he'd have the levers to pull to make it happen. So I think that he would have been president um, if he'd run seriously. Uh, I think that the reason that he didn't run was because he made a deal with Calvin Coolidge, a backroom deal. There's some, the, I present the evidence in the book. Uh, Henry Ford and Calvin Coolidge, the president of the United States, the world's richest man, um, got together in the White House and hatched a deal. And Henry Ford agreed not to run for president that meant that Calvin Coolidge could run. And in exchange, Calvin Coolidge was going to push for uh, Ford's control of this project. That was, that was the deal that was struck. It was a secret deal. It was controversial. Um, there's evidence that it happened. But once the news, it, what happened was George Norris got a hold of the scandal. He found out about this secret meeting and he blasted it all over the media. Um, once it became a public scandal, uh, Calvin Coolidge backed off. Henry Ford by then had already said he wasn't going to run for president. So he, Ford took himself out of the running for president prematurely. And he never got muscle, he never got this project, but he also never got to be president. Had he been president, my view is he would have been a president unlike any president we've ever had. He would have been a, an autocrat because he was accustomed to being an autocrat. He would have um, been unable to deal effectively with groups like Congress or the press or anyone else. He would have just wanted his own way. It would have been a very interesting four years. Didn't happen though. Ford, in, in, in fairness, Ford didn't really want to be president. He knew that he was lucky to have the job he had. As the world's richest one-man band, he ran this enormously profitable company, and he could do what he wanted. He could tell anybody what he wanted to tell them. He didn't have to make nice. He didn't have to slap backs or kiss babies, and he loved that. So he he wasn't built to be a politician, um, and he knew it. He knew it. His and especially his wife Clara knew it. Uh, his wife was dead set against Henry Ford being president, and she was a very powerful figure in his life. So when she told him that she didn't want him to be president, that had an effect. Interesting. You just mentioned that he, about the press. And um, you wrote in your book that he, Ford was a publicity genius. Yeah. It sounds like it contradicts what you just said. 
Yes. Well, he, I, I said that he wouldn't be able to work with the press um, okay. if he was president. And as a private citizen, as, a, um, as an industrialist, he maintained a very large public relations office in the Ford Motor Company. Um, and it grew over the years. It was very powerful. He, he was uh, a genius at publicity. So in addition to everything else, he had the most positive media coverage you can imagine. Everybody was interested in what Henry Ford was doing. And yet he was this folksy guy who had a sixth grade education. He could, you know, his nickname at the time was Uncle Henry. He was like a member of your family. He, he spoke plainly. He didn't, you know, he didn't try and obfuscate. He was an enemy of Wall Street and bankers, which most workers in America were at the time uh, as well. And and uh, Americans loved him. Well, that was due in great part to the fact that he had this relations army working for him um, that grew over time to include essentially what people said was a private police force that would investigate his enemies as well. But that's that. The point is that he knew how to work with the press as in that in that level. He did not know how to work with the press as a public servant. He had never been a public servant. And that's a different role. Pull the wool over people's eye. Well, you could argue the point. But in any case, I think uh, it's the basic difference between politics and business. Uh, you, Henry Ford was highly successful in one field. I feel he would have been less successful. To be fair to the journalists at the time, you know, newspaper reporters and uh, wire reporters at the time always gave Henry Ford a break. They reported uh, public interest features, you know, what Henry Ford wore to an event. And they focused on that um, because they knew that they could sell paper Uncle Henry image alive was important for the media too. Um, had he become president, there would be an automatic opposition press, you know, instantaneous uh, tax on Ford. Another story that's told in the book is about a, a weak point for Ford. In addition to his folksy um, man of the people persona, which is true, a vicious um, anti-Semite, and he uh, did terrific damage, I think, um, by using his public relations arm to attack uh, Jewish uh, citizens around the world, uh, Jewish citizens of the United States in particular. Um, he blamed the, uh, uh, well, it, it, it was a form of anti-Semitism that has to be read to be believed. Uh, that was a weak point that he had as well. So not every group in America was behind him. Farmers were behind him. Uh, uh, the middle swath of America, sort of mid the Midwest and South were uh, very much behind Ford's plan. Um, the East Coast and West Coast were not and uh, were more dubious about his claims. So he was a popular figure, but as a politician, I think it would have been uh, very difficult, very difficult for him. Makes sense. Okay, I have another patron question here. Did the Alabama planned city have any relationship to Fortlandia in Brazil? Can you compare and contrast these two sites? Fortlandia was a book that came out a few years ago about a, another huge Ford project. Um, this time uh, it was an attempt to make a rubber uh, empire in uh, South America in Brazil. So thank you for bringing that up. Fordlandia is a great book. And, and uh, I think that both of those, uh, Fordlandia happened a little later. Um, after Ford was blocked from doing his utopian city, um, after his plan with Edison fell through and the, and the government stepped in, um, he looked for other ways to uh, use that same energy. And one of the projects that he did was Fordlandia. I think that um, had the city on the Tennessee River happened, I don't think Fordlandia would have, or at least not in the same way. 
So it was another attempt to create a huge project. That was the scale that Ford liked to play at. You know, he, he did enormous projects. He just, he didn't do little things. The irony is that, I think the irony is that the end result of all of his planning is probably best exemplified by a park that he built in Dearborn, Michigan, um, near his factories. Uh, what he decided to do and what he put a lot of energy into late in his life after the events of, of the story that I tell, um, he put enormous energy into creating the kind of America he wanted, but as a sort of a theme park. And so if you ever go to Dearborn, I recommend that you go visit the Ford Museum. The Ford Museum is a beautiful facility and it has every car that Ford ever made, I, I'm pretty sure, and um, a number of machines that affected his thinking as well. It's the story of a tremendous American success story, Henry Ford and the Ford Motor Company, a beautiful museum. There's a wonderful archive there. I spent a week at the archive researching the book. And then there's a third component, which is this theme, essentially a theme park. And it is um, an idea that caught Ford's fancy late in life to create the kind of America that, that he thought was the true America. So he would buy the birthplaces of famous Americans, like the buildings where they were born, including his own, the, the house where he grew up. He moved it from the farm in Michigan to this park and he set it down and created a, a little farm around it. And he bought Thomas Edison's workshop and he moved it to Dearborn and he set it in his park and he bought the, um, I think it's, I think Nathaniel Hawthorne's birthplace is there and a, a schoolroom, the Wright brothers um, shop where they sold bicycles. It's, he would collect buildings the way that other people collect, you know, China plates or I don't know, whatever people collect. He would collect buildings. He'd bring them to Dearborn, put them on, you know, in this park. And he created this fabulous, wonderful place where you can actually see American architecture changing, um, laid out um, parts of it in, in the, it, there's, there's a central part of it that's in the form of a village green, which is sort of like Henry Ford's dream of America. It has a, you know, a white church house uh, with a steeple at one end and a, and a grist mill on a pond and, um, you know, these beautiful uh, houses, at an old colonial um, inn and so on. It just laid out. And so it's remarkable to me that he went from building, you know, wanting to build a 75 mile working city to doing this charming but unusual uh, theme park. In, in Dearborn, Michigan. Anyway, if you're ever up in those parts, uh, yeah, give it a visit. Oh, we're not too awfully far from Michigan here. Yes. <laughs> okay, we have uh, one more question from the patrons. Um, do you have any knowledge or information of the adversarial relationship Henry Ford had with John D. Rockefeller? If so, please share the story and the outcome. I do not. I didn't, I didn't study Ro uh, Rockefeller at all for this book. Um, I have I have looked at Henry at, at uh, John Rockefeller John D Rockefeller for other projects. He was very much involved in science. The history of science in America owes a lot to the Rockefeller Foundation, um, and uh, so I've studied Rockefeller from that standpoint. The only overlap that I came across um, for this book uh, between Ford and Rockefeller had to do with the with the Germans. And uh, it's, a, it's a, another little known story, but one that I haven't fully researched, I'm not really ready to talk about, other than saying in broad outline that in, uh, you know, Henry Ford made his money off of cars, right? And John D. Rockefeller made his money off of the oil to run the cars. Um, around the time of World War I, the world it looked like the world was running out of oil. Natural oil reserves were thought to be much smaller than they've proven to be. And there was great worry that the uh, world was going to run dry of oil. And if the oil went, you know, if there was no more oil, 
then uh, Rockefeller wouldn't make any money, Ford wouldn't make any money. Um, at the same time, uh, just after World War I, the Germans uh, who had been defeated in the war were looking for ways to build their industry. And they came up with a plan to make uh, synthetic oil. They were going to um, perfect a method, a very difficult method technologically, to um, take coal from German coal mines and turn it into automobile fuel, into gasoline, essentially, or they could also turn it into airplane fuel. Uh, so they would make oil, uh, gasoline for cars out of coal. There was tons of coal around the world. And that project uh, for synthetic oil that the Germans were running was very interesting, both to Rockefeller and to Ford. And uh, the, the records are, are, are difficult. I think a lot of records have been destroyed or, or lost or seek or, or are not available to the public around this project. But essentially, it would have been a collaboration between two of the biggest industries in the United States and the biggest chemical industry in the world, which was developing this synthetic oil work in Germany, uh, which was a group called IG Farben. IG Farben, Ford, and Standard Oil may have, uh, and there's some evidence that they did, uh, collaborate in between the two wars in developing this new industry. Um, th there were shares of stock exchanged and money exchanged, uh, intellectual property um, passed back and forth. The problem was, as, as it turned out later, that Hitler came to power in the early 1930s in Germany. IG Farben was Nazified. It became a Nazi industrial firm. And um, the work that Ford and Rockefeller Standard Oil were doing became very problematic uh, for a number of reasons at that point. But there's some evidence that it continued um, into the Nazi era as, uh, era as well. So that, that story is, a, you know, I wish I could dig out the records. Um, but I don't know if anybody ever will. I think that most of the records have been destroyed or are uh, kept away from the public my own view. Uh, however, that, that overlap did occur. Other than that, um, you know, I didn't really look at Rockefeller and Ford. Fair enough. Okay, we have one last question from a patron. For those of us who may not know much about the TVA, how much of Ford's dream for Electric City was developed by the government, and what was Edison's involvement in this dream? Yeah. Um, good, good question. Edison sort of dropped out of the process. Um, Edison, uh, I believe, helped Ford with his ideas as a favor to a friend. And once the going got rough, once the Congress started uh, stiffening its opposition, um, Edison, some of Edison's thinking came under attack. And he was an old man at this time. So he pretty much dropped out um, before the government finally took over. Uh, control of the project. Uh, so Edison wasn't much of a figure. The question is, you know, what did the TVA do with Ford's ideas? And that's uh, covered at length in the book. And it, it raises um, an interesting question about the relationship between public and private projects uh, in the United States. This was a large scale project that involved a lot of people and a lot of money, a lot of power, in the central part of the United States, in you know, in in northern Alabama and Tennessee area, and um, it naturally raised concerns about sort of public control over public resources. One of the resources, the most important, being the river itself, and the question of public control of rivers. It gets into interstate commerce and flood control and irrigation all the things we use rivers for uh, came into play because the government didn't want to give Henry Ford control of the whole river, but if he had control of the dams on the river, he would have sort of control over what, how the river was developed. Would the, would the development be for the public good or for private good? 
these questions still resonate today and are still argued about today. Who is best in charge? Is business more efficient and effective? Or is government more concerned about the real, uh, getting real value out of public resources? Which should be in charge of large projects like this? Those arguments were being um, bandied about 100 years ago for this project. It came out in favor of the government. The government took over the project. Ford eventually, after his deal with Calvin Coolidge, Ford dropped out. And the government took over. George Norris designed the TVA, uh, this uh, huge government project that went into effect when Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president. This is in the depths of the Depression. The Depression hit the South worse than most other parts of the country. It was, it was already an area that was economically troubled and the depression was crushing to people in the South of the United States, um, which is why they were attracted to Ford's idea. You know, Ford really promised economic revival. Uh, what happened was the government took over, they came in and finished the dams that uh, Ford had thought of, but they finished them in a different way. They weren't just concerned with electric power, although that was part of it. They were concerned with flood control because there were devastating floods along the Tennessee. They were concerned with irrigation. They were concerned with um, public access to parks and to the lakes that built up behind the dams. Um, and what they wanted to do, what, what FDR wanted to do, this was an important part of his New Deal for America. He wanted to create jobs during the Depression, but he wanted to do it in ways that benefited all Americans as much as possible. So the dams got built, the lakes are established. There's more coastline in right now on these lakes in Northern Alabama than there is in the rest of the United States. There's a string of lakes that just goes on and on and on, it's beautiful. And uh, this tremendous project got finished and the electric power began to flow uh, and industries began to come in. It was all Henry Ford's dream, except they were industries that were not what he would have chosen, but they were industries that required a lot of electric power, like aluminum production. So these industries started coming in and the area did revive. And, and as I said earlier, when you go down there now, it's a, it's, it's a wonderful area. It's, it's just a, a lovely area. It's, it has caught up with the rest of the United States in those years. And yet, there are real questions about whether Henry Ford might not have been a better choice. And I go over the, the dynamics of that. It's kind of complex. But the, uh, the book goes a bit into, like, would we really have been worse off under Henry Ford? The TVA is seen as this enormous success story. But in fact, I make the argument, and I think it's fair to make, that it would have been almost as good under Henry Ford, and some ways would have been more efficient um, as well. There's no easy answer. You know, public versus private, uh, which is best? There is no yes, no, there's, there's no easy answer there. It has to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. TVA was wonderful. TVA was life-changing, generations of lives changing for people in that area. Henry Ford would have done that too. Uh, so anyway, the, it, we end up with a sort of a difficult, very difficult question. That's a good question. <laughs> well, um, I think it's it's time for us to, to wrap it up tonight. I want to, everyone to see this is the book you want to look for. This is Thomas Hager's book we've been talking about tonight. And I want to thank you, Thomas Hager, for being here with us and thank everyone who joined us tonight. And uh, we'll hope to see you all again soon at our next author talk. Okay. Good night, everybody.